So um, thank you again so much for everyone having me this evening. And um, you know, there's so much that's moving in the water world right now. And I appreciate all of you taking the time to, to join this evening and to learn a bit more about what is moving um, some really big milestones right now in the world of water. And so, you know, this evening, I'll probably go into about 40 or 45 minutes. Um, I know we started just a little bit late. Um, so I'll try to keep everything kind of tight, but also I'd love to have an opportunity to have some question and answer. Um, feel free to also pose questions into the chat. Um, but I'm hoping to have some pause moments where we can have a small discussion um, between some of these large kind of three big milestones that are that are ahead of us um, in water right now in Colorado. So with that, let's just go ahead and dive on in. Um, you know, I'd like to just take a moment and give you a little bit of, about my background. Um, I find that everyone has a river story. Um, and mine certainly has been kind of hinged around the Colorado River, although I'm originally from the East Coast. Um, the Colorado River has been in my heart um, since I was very young, um, as an early teenager. Um, so I would love um, in your chat box, um, if you can find it, I'd love to know uh, what your favorite river, um, what your favorite river is, and uh, you know to spend either on or in or around. And it doesn't have to be limited to Colorado. So feel free to to put into the chat um, you, what your favorite river is to be near and about. Um, so I, oh great, I love it. South Platte, Arkansas. Thank you. No, fantastic rivers for sure. Fountain Creek. Crystal River, oh, over on my side, that's great. Fantastic, thank you guys so much. Um, with that, I, um, I have been passionate about rivers my entire life. Um, I began with Audubon Rockies in 2014 and I was actually brought on uh, to really uh, work with our membership in the water plan development. Um, my background is as a stream ecologist um, I work a lot in water policy, but I also bridge uh, restoration projects, education, river science, all around it. So as often as I can, I'm in and around rivers. Um, and I often find myself even as a translator uh, between different you know, decision makers and policy makers, uh, scientists on the ground practitioners. And I can slide kind of in between all of these um, sectors because it's been a part of my background for some time now. All right, um, let me check the chat one more time. Oh, thank you about the photos. You will see this evening a peppering of beautiful bird photos, but many of my favorite river photos as well. So I'm glad you enjoy it uh, for sure. And here we go. Let's see if I can get us to advance here. There we go. So water is one of Audubon's core strategic priorities. Our water work, um, our work in water covers coasts, saline lakes, and western water with a focus on the Colorado River. Audubon engages and involves the public on issues surrounding water rights and water quality, water policies and frameworks. We work to restore habitats along rivers and wetlands and deltas. And we explore solutions that contribute to the achievement of our water goals. Um, but really what it comes down to, the bottom line is Audubon protects birds and the places they need today and tomorrow. So we focus our efforts, um, I focus certainly some deep efforts here on the Colorado River because it's critical support for 400 species of birds and a lifeline to communities, uh, economies, and agriculture in the West. Riverside habitats that line the Colorado River and tributaries support some of the most abundant and diverse bird communities in the arid world. The river flows through both the Central and Pacific migratory flyways. And we're still living in an, uh, an uncertain future um, with a persistent drought uh, since 1999, coupled with Hence, variable hydrology in the Colorado River Basin, it makes for a really iffy future as we go forward. And that's where it's really critical that we all lean in and learn more about water, and particularly our namesake river. Okay, perfect. 
The Colorado River is arguably managed by the most complex system in the world. Prior appropriation doctrine, uh, the law of the river, couple this with climate change, variable hydrology, and very real and observable trends in water decline. All of this is driving policy and restoration work right down to the ground. The Audubon Rockies territory covers a portion of three out of the four upper basin states and um, in the upper Colorado River Basin. My work uh, in Colorado and also in the upper Colorado River Basin tip, I really focus in Colorado, however. Um, kind of this slide kind of shows the different where areas and how I kind of merge things together um, in my work, but it really comes down to using the very best available science, partnerships, and our network to accomplish water and habitat goals for birds and people. And of all these different sectors where I regularly work in, um, water awareness and fluency is key. And so I really appreciate your time this evening coming aboard and leaning in and learning more about water. So Audubon is engaged in more balanced and sustainable solutions in Colorado for very clear reasons. Birds and Coloradans depend on healthy freshwater ecosystems every single day. The future of all of Colorado, and that is say all of Colorado because that is people and the environment included, is dependent on clean, reliable water coming from healthy rivers and watersheds, and each of us are connected by it. So I want, to th want you to kind of think for a moment, while you're out birding, where do you find the most abundant and diverse bird species? There's typically always around waterways. And stewardship of Colorado's waterways is essential to the long-term health of Colorado's economy, ecosystems, and communities. Investing in clean and plentiful waterways isn't just good for the environment, but it's good for our economy too. So I wanted to highlight a study that came out in 2020 um, that was done by one of our partner organizations, Business for Water Stewardship. And Business for Water Stewardship um, through their partnered study um, with Southwick Associates, evaluated, interviewed Coloradans and evaluated what the annual water-based economic impact uh, of our waterways are. And it comes down to Colorado receives just shy of $19 billion a year on healthy waterways and water-based recreation. And so let's look a little bit about what, how that breaks down statewide. Um, again, about a little over 1,300 Coloradans were interviewed in how they utilized uh, waterways in their recreation. And I wanted you to take a look at this $18.8 .8 billion and how it breaks out by participation activity. Um, I also want you to notice that wildlife watching is right around 1.2 million a year. And so um, either by show of Zoom hands or physical hands, I'd love to know how many of you contributed to that $1.2 million spent in wildlife watching in Colorado. <laughs> I know I'm a part of that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we have quite a rich abundance and dependency upon our waterways. And I thought it would be good to take a look maybe just a little bit deeper at the Arkansas, um, since that of course is relevant. And that the Arkansas River Basin on whole receives roughly $2.6 billion a year on water-based um, economies, uh, water recreation-based economies. And looking at that, you know, over 18,000 jobs supported, and um, 1.6 million individuals participated in some sort of water-related recreation. And that also evaluates residential as well as non-residential um, utilization. So there's large numbers, they seem huge and they are, rightly so. I feel that our waterways are iconic and a key component of our Colorado lifestyle and certainly for our wildlife. 
And along with this, um, with this income, I want you to know that this is also including the amplifier effect. So if someone comes into the Arkansas Basin, uh, stays at a hotel, purchases some binoculars, or purchases a guide service to go out um, wildlife watching or uh, paddling, potentially rafting essential, all of those um, contribute to this bottom line dollar figure. So it's still remarkable. And I bring this forward because sometimes we have to talk about money um, when we talk about river health conservation um, and advocacy as well. So having some of these dollar figures at hand are very um, usually well received. So with that, I'd love to you know, we kind of established of the why water matters, um, certainly in the environmental and recreational world. And at the, the fear of being repetitive, Colorado as a whole is dependent on clean, reliable water coming from healthy rivers and watersheds. We're gonna move into a discussion around the water plan, but I wanna ask you, you know, what memories can you recall from five years ago? Well, if you're an Audubonner for over five years, you may remember that we put in a lot of effort into providing public input on Colorado's inaugural water, water plan that was finalized in 2015. The Audubon Network, our partners and Coloradans were key in defining this plan. And five years of plan implementation have absolutely flown by. So as the plan moves forward into its first update, we're working together on that update. Great. So Colorado's water plan is moving through the first update right now. And the water plan charts the path toward a more sustainable water future for people and the environment. And again, our water is arguably Colorado's most valuable and precious natural resource. Our water plan and the funding for the water plan is perhaps more important than ever as we find ourselves in the midst of an absolutely relentless drought, particularly on the West Slope. I should have mentioned um, home for me is just about 21 miles, 22 miles maybe from the Utah line, just Southwest of Grand Junction. So um, we are certainly experiencing the drought firsthand here at our property and in our community. So I'd like to take a moment as well and just kind of pause again, Audubon, we provided a significant chunk of the unprecedented civic engagement that Colorado saw during the creation of the first water plan. The Colorado Water Conservation Board received 30, over 30,000 public comments. And of those 30,000 public comments, Audubon supplied nearly 20% of those 30,000 public comments. We were incredibly active on the water plan and were key in helping to establish some of the really good goals of stream management plans and watershed management plans uh, in the plan, as well as lifting up um, environmental resilience language to discuss stream ecology needs in the water plan. And so that's all from our Audubon network, as well as some of our partners work as well. So show of Zoom hands, how many folks put public comment in during the development of the 2015 water plan. And if you answer some of our action alerts, you certainly are part of that 30,000 public comments on that. So super, great, thanks John very much. Thanks for that. You know, these wins were really brought by people leaning in and in participating in the water plan development. So it is Colorado's water plan. And here we are in the first update. So we've got a couple levels of engagement here. And I'd like to share with you on the slide are some of the priorities that Audubon and, and certainly I am working on. And there are two scales of engagement, one at the state level, uh, which will be coming you know, mid next year in 2022, and a more localized kind of basin level, which is getting ready to ramp up right now. Um, some of our, just to kind of talk about the larger kind of statewide level goals, um, what I have, I've worked with all the different basin roundtables around the state over the last year, safely and outdoors and, and met with the basin roundtable environmental and recreational representatives. And one of the unanimous needs that basins need 
um, are really to examine environmental data gaps. And um, so we're working um, on kind of 2.0 here uh, to have um, some additional attention and activity dedicated towards helping basins um, evaluate and hopefully try to fill some of these environmental data gaps. So you don't know what you don't know and you can't manage for what you don't know. Um, so we're looking to help um, along the ways to be able to learn more about river conditions and wetland conditions and basins. Uh, we're certainly going to continue to promote and support stream management plans and certainly healthy headwaters. Um, and here's a very uh, a newer aspect um, that we are engaged in as well. Um, equity, diversity and inclusion or EDNI for short. Um, you may have heard in some of the news that um, the Colorado Water Conservation Board is embarking upon a water equity task force. And I have been recruited as one of the 20-ish members um, from around the state to look into how can we um, include more people in our water decision-making processes. And so that work um, of the Water Equity Task Force is just getting off the ground and will certainly be flexing um, our engagement abilities to hopefully bring in more people um, to allow confidence and participation in this water decision-making space. Um, and so we certainly plan to, again, activate our Audubon network at scale um, when we are ready, both at the local level and at the statewide level as we're able to uh, review documents because we're setting the course for over seven years of water management with this water plan update. So it's gonna take all of us and on that localized uh, basin front, um, all nine of our basins, the major basins across the state, are now working on updating their water management plans, which include environmental support and provisions. Um, these water management plans are called basin implementation plans, if that's a new term uh, for you. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Okay, so I can get my slide to advance here. There we go. Um, something I thought was very interesting, the um, just recently, just in April, or maybe late March, the Colorado Water Conservation Board um, has worked to develop a mapping process that helps to look at environmental and recreational focal areas. And so I wanted to provide this information to you because um, part of the basin implementation plan update and the water plan update are making sure that there are support processes um, to support basin specific environmental and recreational areas. So this is just one map. I have the link there um, and I'm certainly happy to provide that in the chat once I stop uh, sharing my screen. But I wanted to let you know that this is publicly available and um, areas uh, have been developed through the 2015 water plan, as well as um, some updates uh, included in the 2019 um, kind of update. So I wanted to let you know where folks are kind of focusing some of the environmental and recreational priorities in your area. Okay. All right. So there we go. So I'd love to, again, show of Zoom hands how many people have ever attended the Arkansas Basin Roundtable? Has anybody attended one of those? And no is a fine answer. Zoom hands by show of Zoom hands, <laughs> if you like, um, if you've attended the Arkansas Basin Roundtable. Well, if that's a new term for you, um, the Basin Roundtable is actively creating and updating these um, basin implementation plans and participating in the water plan update. I have the links there on the screen. Um, it's a great time to observe or participate in one of the basin roundtable meetings because right now um, they are still on Zoom at the moment. So it's an easy way to be able to um, check in and just see what the water decision makers um, in your basin are discussing. And typically there's a time for public comment that you could 
elevate any other additional needs that you might have. And the Arkansas is very fortunate as well. Um, with, uh, I, I had got to visit with the Arkansas Environmental and Recreation Subcommittee uh, last summer uh, to discuss the environmental and recreational projects and gather some more data on river conditions in the basin uh, and help that with the basin implementation plan update. And I want you to know that you have a great team of folks working on this environmental and recreational subcommittee. Um, and I just, uh, as well, um, coming up forward, probably towards the end of this summer, I wanna say maybe in August, we might be able to have public review of the basin implementation plans. And that will be a time where I will be calling on local chapters to take a look at these documents and make sure that we have good environmental projects represented and that um, the areas that you would like to see focal and prioritized, I kind of hate to word, use the word prioritize because that kind of involves a hierarchy. So if there are areas that you would like the Basin Roundtable to focus on more, that's a great time to also offer that public feedback. And so we'll be working together more closely towards the end of summer when these uh, plans get ready to be reviewed. So um, in addition, another place you can plug in uh, to some of the water management uh, in the Arkansas is the Arkansas River Watershed Collaborative. If you're not familiar with these folks, they are doing extraordinary work and really discussing across kind of water divides, um, different topics that really look at the watershed approach to management. So I wanted to make sure everyone had these links uh, available and can participate there. But um, why don't we take a moment and just pause just for just maybe two minutes. Um, I love to ask a question when you can feel free to put it into the chat or uh, maybe unmute yourself if you're comfortable with that. But I just want you, and you might just want to think about this question as well. You, there's no need to respond, but just an, an open call if you feel to respond um, is where do you see yourself fitting in the water plan? Where do you see yourself activating or interested in your local basin implementation plan, your water management plan, or in the larger state water plan? Are the places that you feel particularly called uh, to engage with? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Water conservation, that's a huge one. We're going to touch on that here in just a moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything from healthy rivers, healthy wetlands, better use of water in our cities and towns, all of these are efforts that truly, um, truly deserve attention and continued work um, across the state. So I appreciate that. Um, we'll just continue on here, okay? All right, there we go. So that's our first milestone. Oh, thank you, Kayla, for about the water pollution and quality. We will talk about that here in just a moment too, um, as our third milestone that's coming forward. So thank you all. Um, so I'd love to move us forward into talking about uh, the Colorado River. Um, it is a big year, not only for Colorado's water plan moving forward into its first update, but also the Colorado River. And water is life and it connects all of us, birds and people alike. You know, we need to engage on moving towards water security for the environment and people together. And we really have no time to delay. Climate change impacts are here and intensifying. And in fact, climate change is often referred to by scientists as water change. The Colorado River is getting ready to move into its update or the renegotiations of the Colorado River Compact itself. That is, in, that is kicking off and in earnest this year. And 
So there's a lot riding and I bring up the drought monitor, um, which I just updated. Um, this is May 11th is the, er, is the most recent update um, that I could find for the drought monitor. And I want you to know that that may be your favorite shade of red, that deep red, brown, dark red, brown, but that is not the color you wanna see on a drought monitor map. Those dark, the darkest red brown that you see is an indication of drought level four, which is exceptional drought. It, there is not a color that gets any worse um, than that. So you can see over the Colorado River basin itself, Colorado, Utah, much of Arizona and some of New Mexico and even into Southern California there, quite a bit of that exceptional drought level. And then I also want you to notice um, on the right-hand side of that slide is, excuse me, is a comparison from January of this year to May. We've had a noticeable improvement, but west of the Continental Divide on the West Slope, we are still experiencing a vast amount of exceptional drought. And so these drought conditions are, have been exacerbated from low soil moistures. We went into winter um, with incredibly dry soils and the increased temperatures that we're seeing were evaporating more water. And even with about a 75% snowpack on average around the state, uh, our Colorado River flows are dwindling almost by the day of the water that's gonna make it to Lake Powell because the soil will take the first drink and the warmer temperatures will evaporate water more quickly. This is creating a system-wide stress on the Colorado River Basin as a whole. Lakes Mead and Lake Powell um, are at historic lows and shortages are looking to be declared potentially even later this year for states like Arizona uh, and others in the lower basin. This creates a quite a bit of risk for the environment and agriculture, particularly with this kind of drought. So the average flow of the Colorado River has declined by nearly 20% over the last century, half of which is because of warming temperatures. And that's really, that's scientific consensus there. With the region's snowpack shrinking and melting earlier, the ground absorbs more heat and more of this precious water evaporates. Um, and it really confirms, you know, some of the model-based analysis that's coming out that continued warming will likely further reduce flows in the river. And so recently published estimates of the Colorado River flow sensitivity to temperature combined with a large number of recent climate model based uh, projections indicate that continued business as usual warming due to greenhouse gas emissions will drive temperature decline, induced declines in river flow, maybe by another 20% by mid-century and maybe 35% by the end of the century. Um, and all of this on a river um, that does not reach the sea currently. As the Colorado River was developed in the 20th century, the delta dried out and it was an inadvertent impact uh, of overwater development in the United States and Mexico. For the last several decades, the river stops short, maybe about 60 to 70 miles before its ocean terminus at the Gulf of California. Today, uh, the supply and demand imbalance that dried the delta is being exacerbated by climate change and Colorado River water uses are experiencing shortages now and shortages are likely to deepen in the near future. But it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> I want to bring up this, um, the elevate the Colorado River because it is beginning to go into this huge renegotiation of how we use it um, as, a, as seven states and tribe, tribal usage, water usage, and Mexico all coming to the table to renegotiate um, how this river is used. But I want to talk about one of the most celebrated partnerships, the work to rewater the Colorado River Delta. 
The Delta was a 2 million acre ecosystem at the downstream end of the Colorado River Basin and one of the most abundant and diverse ecosystems on the planet, particularly for birds. This picture that you're seeing right now does not look like a diverse and abundant ecosystem by any stretch of the imagination, but folks have been working together to resolve this and help to revive the Delta. And I want you to know that earlier this May, this May, this month, water started flowing in the Delta in May, 2021. And even though we have such dry conditions, this really comes down to binational water conservation between the US and Mexico, making the Colorado River more sustainable for people and birds. So right now, right now as we talk, the Colorado River is running through its delta and is expected to again touch the sea later this year. It's a smaller, more like a, a extended trickle of water to help revive the riparian and wetland vegetation. So reconnecting the Colorado River to the sea has only happened a few times in the last several decades and has been a project spearheaded by friend and Audubon Colorado River Program Director Jennifer Pitt. NGOs working in the Raise the River Coalition advocate for bilateral solutions to environmental challenges in the Delta. Over time, NGOs figured out the best way to get the US and Mexico to address habitat restoration in the Delta was to get the US and Mexico working together on a broader set of Colorado River issues, including some of the frameworks around water shortage uh, sharing in the context of climate change. Um, earlier this evening, I popped into the chat uh, multiple links uh, and I want to make sure that you do read Jennifer Pitt's uh, latest article that just came out last week on reconnecting the Colorado River to the sea. We could all use good news, and this is good news for the local people, birds, and the river as a whole. So make sure to check that link out. So I want to ask you, what's your connection to the Colorado River? And while you're kind of reflecting on that, and feel free to pop in any answers into the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and, and kind of respond to that. But the value of the Colorado River, it touches, even though it's a, a West Slope River, the Colorado River water it touches every corner of the state um, and how we move and use it. And so this river connects our entire state. And, you know, really in, in all decision-making processes related to the Colorado River, the best available science around water availability and climate change must be heard here. From large system-wide decisions to local decisions about projects and future trans mountain diversions, diversions from the West Slope to the Front Range. And I, I bring this up delicately because this kind of includes the discussions that are around Whitney Reservoir right now. New reservoir projects could have to cut their usage to make sure enough water is sent downstream to make sure that our needs in the Colorado River Compact requirement are, are met. So as the Colorado River dries with climate change and more demand is put on the river, there's a higher risk for what's called a compact call. And that's um, kind of a provision that gives downstream states uh, the authority to demand water from upstream states like Colorado um, if they don't if we don't send enough water down the Colorado River itself. So let me just check the chat real quick here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Linda, absolutely. Concerns definitely do continue to grow and uh, specifically around West Slope water um, because West Slope water in the past has seemingly been infinite. And as we have changed in climate change and our population and how we move water around the state, it's certainly changing our abilities. Um, and, and, you know, I have to ask these, these kind of questions. You know, we need to answer at least two questions in looking at different projects coming forward. Is the water better left in the river? Or does it create more risk to take it out of the Colorado River never to return for a water project? And could water conservation, reuse and efficiency be a more sure bet for water security? Um, and so 
I ask, I bring these up because how can we engage? How can we engage in this process? And my advice is to really, you know, Colorado is looked to as a leader in the upper Colorado River Basin. So the states of Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and a portion of New Mexico. Colorado has been really leading the way um, in multiple fronts here. And so I request that keep an eye on the headlines uh, around the Colorado River Basin, uh, around the drought and Lakes Powell and Mead levels. The Colorado River Compact is beginning its renegotiation process this year. The Colorado River Compact itself is almost 100 years old. And we do not have a clear path yet on what the renegotiation process will look like. But renegotiations of the compact will take a number of years. And it's safe to say that hydrology and drought might push that, that process forward even faster. Okay. So our third pillar to talk about uh, this evening, our last big milestone uh, to discuss tonight is just recently there have been huge movements in clean water protection rollbacks um, and changes in Colorado. And so I wanted to make sure to bring this up uh, for us to understand and know that, that Audubon, we are engaged on this as a whole. So water supports the lives of every Coloradan and our environment every day. All of us depend on healthy flowing rivers, whether you're an agricultural producer, that you live in a city or a town, or you own a business, or you're recreation, or recreating, excuse me, or if you're or just in the environmental services um, that we receive from rivers and wetlands. Recent rollbacks of federal clean water protections now leave 25% or more of the state's waters without environmental protections. And this just happened this past April on the 23rd. The Federal Clean Water Protections Rule, known as the Trump Administration's Navigable Water Protections Rule, took effect in Colorado on April 23rd, 2021, and substantially rolled back federal protections that were established in 2008. And even the, even the protections established prior to that time. The substantial rollbacks leave upwards of 25,000 miles of Colorado streams at risk to pollution and construction impacts. It's estimated that 25 to 50% of our Colorado waters could be impacted by the rollback of these federal protections. And so I'll offer as well that earlier this evening, I've written two blogs recently around how these changes around the federal protections have impacted Colorado. And I'd love to make sure that um, they are on your radar, that you open up in your browser and make sure to take a look and read them and go a little deeper into some of that background because it is staggering um, how we have changed the landscape of protections um, under this current um, federal rule. And there is some discussion about, well, if the Trump administration was able to roll back these protections um, so significantly, why can't the Biden administration just simply reinstate what was prior to the Trump administration? And these pendulum swings are so hard. Um, it took the Trump administration almost three years to do this. The Biden administration, there are discussions now around potentially uh, developing a new Clean Water Act protection suite and discussion. So it's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some time and it certainly will fight its way out in the courts. But the real problem right now of where we stand under the navigable water protections rule is that under this rule, um, the kinds of ephemeral or intermittently flowing waterways, you know, those waterways that flow right after a precipitation event and they don't flow throughout the year, these water bodies are now excluded from federal regulation under this revamped rule. And that makes up a large part of the waterways we have here in our state and all across the Southwest. So what does all of this mean for birds and people? 
The mapping I'm showing you right here is newly developed by Trout Unlimited and the Nature Conservancy to show what reduced protections for Colorado streams and wetlands look like under the new federal rule. And so the darker the color, the worse it is. And um, certainly in the map that you see on your left, you'll notice that almost the entire Rio Grande and much of the eastern Arkansas basin um, reduce or remove protections altogether because there are so many wetlands in the basins. And this particularly hits hard to wetlands um, that do not have a surface water connection uh, to rivers. So this impacts birds and wildlife and all of the ecological services that we people depend upon for clean water and the connectivity of upstream to downstream water processes, these are all at risk now um, and will have a cumulative impact the further downstream that you go. So the Colorado Department of Health and Environment over the last, over, over a year now, has been hosting some stakeholder processes um, that certainly I have been participating in and many others um, around what could Colorado do to have a state program that would protect our waters so that we do not weather these huge pendulum swings in federal administration. And um, the Department of Health and Environment has done a Herculean job of trying to include everyone's input in creating a protections program that would just simply have the status quo um, prior to the Trump uh, navigable water protections rule. And it has been met with pretty stiff headwinds. Um, the Department of Health and Environment's proposal, uh, draft legislation, um, included agricultural exemptions for irrigation ditches and other conservation practices that agricultural um, producers typically employ, but we just can't seem to get there um, on consensus. We were hoping to see legislation back in April to be introduced, but there have been um, there has been significant resistance from um, leadership at the Capitol and industry. And a state clean water permitting bill this year looks very unlikely. We are still working with um, Department of Health and Environment on working on what we're calling Plan B <laughs> right now, which is to increase funding available for the Department of Health and Environment for inspection and now enforcement um, while we are trying to address uh, these roadblocks, particularly in our House, or I'm sorry, in our Senate. Um, so likely we will also see um, this issue of clean water permitting, which is sometimes also called dredge and fill, uh, because it tends to regulate what you can dig out and put in um, to different water bodies. So um, we will likely see this in the summer interim water resources review committee um, that the committee hosts, um, potentially a, a statewide roadshow, but maybe at least virtually I anticipate that we're going to see a lot move of movement here. Um, so how to stay engaged? How can you engage? How can you be a part of this process to help protect what is so precious to birds and to people, um, our waterways? Um, the way I should say it much is stay tuned. I will be in touch quickly um, if we see any legislation uh, that we need to move forward on. And then also maybe calling on uh, our network to provide comments um, over the summer to the Interim Water Resources Review Committee on the importance of protecting our waterways and their connectivity. So stay tuned uh, for more engagement there. And then also um, in the link that I provided also at the beginning of uh, our session, there is an, a blog called um, A Double Threat to Colorado's Water Quality. Please take a moment and read that. Um, I don't have time to go into it this evening, but we're also Audubon Rockies as part of a coalition 
that we are activating in support of um, a of the Water Quality Control Commission not changing a rule called Regulation 31, and it would allow greater water pollution, basically, a water quality degradation um, across the state. There is a petition at the bottom of that uh, blog that is open until next week. And I would love if you can make sure to activate on that petition. Uh, I am and I am goal setting. We have already broken all Audubon Rockies petition engagement. We have over 2,800 signatures on that petition, which I will personally present to the Water Quality Control Commission in June, on June 14th. And my goal is for 3,000. And uh, we smashed previous records of the low 2000s. So please sign that petition and circulate the link um, because this is a moment where we can really activate and hopefully make a key change at a key moment. All right, oops, there we go. So to just kind of sum up and really bring it home of how water connects us in the past and sometimes even in the present, water can be, you know, we can see opposing sides to how we use it and manage it. But I wanna say that more truthfully, there is far more that connects us in water issues than separates. <clears throat> There's rich common ground across all these sectors that I show here on the screen. There are common values of our watersheds that you know, from healthy flowing rivers to recreation, to aesthetic scenery, to wildlife watching, reduced flood risk, wildfire mitigation and recovery, clean, reliable drinking water, thriving communities and economies. These are core values of water providers, of ranchers, of farmers, of urban folks, of wildlife watchers, of hunters, of Republicans and Democrats, and people of all backgrounds and identities. Audubon is committed to protecting the health of Colorado's rivers, our ecosystems, and sustainable water supplies. These are values that benefit everyone. I am working across water interests to show that water connects rather than divides us. I say often because the science and economics certainly point to it, that Colorado thrives when our rivers do. The decisions we make about river health impact all of Colorado, birds, environment, people. I wanna thank you for your attention this evening and learning more about these three key areas that we need to all be vigilant in. We are all connected by water. Now is the time for Coloradans to come together and expand our water awareness and advocate for sustainable freshwater ecosystems for all of us. And with that, I would love to open it up for any uh, questions and answers for the next couple of moments. Um, if anyone would like to discuss some, some greater issues, um, I am certainly happy to, to entertain those and try to answer them.